Hello, hello everyone. And there we go. Now, now we are all live. Hello. Um, and welcome to Adobe Live APAC. Of course, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we live, learn and create on today, paying respects to others past, present and emerging. Now, I had one job to press all the buttons uh, and we almost got there. But today we are, of course, joined by the wonderful Bill Hope. How are you doing today, Bill? I'm doing very well. How are you going, Joanna? Pretty good. Excited to uh, get uh, into the festive spirit a little bit today. Um, Absolutely. But... It doesn't feel like Christmas until I've done a Adobe Christmas stream. <laughs> exactly. The, like the, really the decorations are starting to come up, but no, not yet. You yeah. have to stream and then it's a virtual. Yeah. Um, play carols from today. Exactly right. But it's it's been a little while since we last had you on. How about a a little brief reintroduction of uh, what you're about and what you do. Sure, sure. So um, my name is Bill Hope. I'm a um, artist and illustrator uh, living in the Blue Mountains. Um, so I work in all kinds of commercial illustration and children's books, um, but I also have a fine art practice as well. So I um, show my work with the, a gallery up here in the Blue Mountains. And um, apart from that, I'm sort of working for a variety of clients doing all kinds of storyboards and advertisements and posters and all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, it's been a it's been a full on year. Um, I'm just sort of I was just saying to Joanna before we got on. I'm just sort of finishing up the last couple projects for the year and very much looking forward to having a break. So um, it's very nice to do a very chilled, um, relaxed stream like this. Absolutely. And speaking of the stream, we just want to say hi to Manny in the chat as well. And as always, if you have any questions as we're going along, press them in the chat and um, I'll do my best to answer answer um, them all today. But since we are doing a festive theme, shall we uh, get celebrating, Bill? Sure, sure. Let's do it. Um... So uh, yeah, um, you can see my screen in Photoshop here. So today we're going to be doing um, a bit of sketching. I'm going to do a bit of sort of uh, more detailed character work. And we're doing two streams, doing one today and one tomorrow. Um, so I was kind of thinking of something that could work for two streams. And I've decided to go with Chris Kingle and Krampus, the man himself. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we've got uh, a sketch here of these two characters. So Chris Kringle being uh, Santa, of course. Um, and uh, then sort of the flip side um, that we've got. So Santa's working on his uh, nice list, obviously, of, of the children that will be getting presents. Mm -hmm. And we've got Krampus over here, who is kind of the opposite of Santa. And we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit more in detail. But he's kind of like the evil Santa, and he's working on his naughty list. Mm -hmm. So today I thought we'd just focus on uh, Krampus. We're going we're gonna to work up a, a, a much more detailed drawing of, of, of this this. Um, slightly nefarious festive character. Um, yeah, so um, I've done quite a bit of this already. So I, I just wanted to spend this stream kind of really getting into the details of this character and, and sort of taking it slow and making something of, of quality. Um, but uh, I'm always keen to hear any questions or, or suggestions that people in the chat have. So if anything comes up, please just shout out and I'll explain what I'm doing or anything else about drawing in Photoshop. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll get started with it. Fantastic. Can't wait. Yeah. Okay. So I'll show you just kind of a couple steps of how I got up to where I am at this point in this drawing. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll start sketching away. So, um, I didn't actually start with, with this, uh, sketch. I, uh, my first sketch was, uh, this, uh, drawing here on the back <laughs> of a shopping list. So you can see I have a slightly more simplistic version of Krampus and, uh, Santa Claus here. And that was kind of what got me what got me thinking about it. Um, and then, uh, so my my second sketch after that was was uh, this one here. So I've got something really loose, just trying to sort of knock these two characters together. Um, the way that I kind of do my digital sketching process is kind of a series of iterations. So I'll start off with something really rough. Then what I do is I kind of drop the opacity back on that till it's really faint. And then I start working up a more detailed version on top. So this was my kind of more detailed version of, of that, where I'm kind of trying to get the expressions right. I'm thinking about um, sort of the details in the character's costume, um, making sure you can see all the bits that are erased here and redrawn, mm. just kind of making sure I've got it right. Um, and uh, I wanted to start this sketch by sort of going into the finished version of it. So I've got my 
sort of close enough um, uh, rough sketch. And now mm -hmm. I'm going to go into the inking of it. So I'll show you what I've done with that. So similar deal, I drop off the opacity of that sketch until it's nice and faint. Um, and then if I turn on uh, this layer, you can see this is all the inking that I've done so far. So I'm trying to sort of uh, work up lots of detail into this character. I really love this kind of drawing where it's, it's, it's very fine and you're sort of trying to get something really sort of graphic and bold out of the character. So um, I thought this was an interesting sort of character to work on because he's got a bunch of different kinds of fur on him. He's <laughs> a, he's kind of a man, half man, half goat kind of character. So he himself has got sort of furry uh, goat legs. Um, and then he's wearing this jacket, um, which has a sort of fur lining, but I didn't want it to be sort of fuzzy, happy fur. I want it to be kind mm. of like lank and gross and messy fur. Yeah, um, can't have any happy fur on canvas. No, no happy <laughs> fur whatsoever. Um, and uh, then I've got like some some feathers coming off here. And once we get onto the, the, the Santa, I'll show, I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. There's lots of different kinds of fur to draw. Mm. Um, yeah, so um, I've left uh, just the face of, of this character undrawn. So I thought we would kind of start there and start inking this one in. Um, Sounds great. Yeah. Before, um, while I start sketching away here, um, uh, before we got onto the stream, Joanna, you were telling me a little bit of the, uh, you'd done some research. You'd gone on a, a deep dive into Krampus uh, lore. So yes. uh, do you want to give us a recap <laughs> on that? Absolutely. Now, I, uh, by deep dive and, and research, um, Bill actually means a 20-minute Google of who is Krampus. Okay. Um, just to refresh my memory, but um, based in, um, well, nowadays based mainly in Austria and Germany, um, Krampus is a, a villainous character, you could say. Um, originally kind of seen as the, the twin or the duality of St. Nicholas who we later see become uh, Santa Claus. Um, Krampus is kind of like the uh, evil twin sort of character. Um, starting out as... He's kind of his uh, wild Luigi to Santa's Luigi. Absolutely. That, that's a better explanation than I was giving. <laughs> um, but essentially you might have, uh, when you were younger, the sort of, if you're not nice or if you're naughty or nice you'll get a present or you'll get um maybe a lump of coal or, or something worse in this case with krampus so the idea here is if kids don't behave throughout the year uh krampus will come on december 5th uh, which is krampus night and um he might uh capture you and bring you back to his lair he might actually bring you to hell since he is said to be related to uh, the god of the underworld in Norse, Norse mythology uh, or he might actually beat you up a little bit with uh, <laughs> with his birch sticks so yeah, not, a little bit more violent in Austria back in the day absolutely yeah back in the day and actually surprisingly to this day uh, Krampus is still I don't know if celebrated is the right right word but he is at least acknowledged so on um, around Krampus night I don't know if it's exactly on December 5th as well but we do have the Krampus run uh, where people dress up as the man himself or the man goat himself uh, I should say and go around um, chasing and also beating people up um, now I will say this was a very 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 quick google uh, just before the stream to re uh, refresh my memory. So if anyone in the chat knows more about Krampus than I do, please uh, correct me and feel free to enlighten us. Um, but that's that's what I'll tell for now. And yeah. then we've got some characteristics and more lore um, that we might get into later. But uh, a menacing character. Um, yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a very interesting character. It's really fun to do these kind of uh, sort of subversions of, of, of such a, a classic character. Um, mm. there's, there's a lot of uh, imagery. There's been a few Krampus movies recently, so I, I spend yes. a bit of time doing my own Googling and, and, and looking up. Um, um, there's quite a lot of Krampus reference now, so I'm kind of doing a pretty classic version of, of, of old Krampus here. Um, I'm going for that um, uh, really sort of over-the-top accentuated uh, eyebrows mm. um, um, and uh, yeah, trying to get a real, real mean face going on here. 
Uh, I looked up some uh, um, images of the uh, the Krampus run that you were talking about, Joanna, mm -hmm. and it's it's a very strange event. It's kind of half. Um, it's sort of like a festive riot or something like that. It's like yeah, a, it is it's like a jolly mob of people. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, uh, because this character is so kind of uh, over the top hairy, I'm going to try and give him some really intense eyebrows here. I'm going, going mm. full um, uh, John very Howard. With, with these ones. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, I would say Not very that there's any relationship between John Howard and Krampus. Just circumstantial <laughs> eyebrows. Um, uh, for any international viewers, it's a figure of politics in in here in Australia. Um, yeah, so um, with this kind of drawing that I'm doing, it's, it's kind of comic-y, but um, uh, I really love working with uh, cross-hatching, um, mm. uh, doing this kind of drawing. Um, I, I really love that sort of building up of lots and lots of detail. And with cross-hatching, you're kind of trying to sort of imagine the three-dimensional contours of the, of the face or, or whatever part that you're drawing. And you're sort of drawing lines that kind of describe that. It's almost like uh, if you had a globe, um, like so, and you had sort of the lines of uh, uh, longitude and, and, and latitude describing that globe. The, the sort of lines tell you that this shape is, 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 it gives you a bit more of a concept of how round it is. And it's mm. a similar kind of thing where you're doing just lots and lots of these little lines that sort of travel along the directional um, planes of, of the um, thing that you're drawing. And I really love sort of, uh, slowly building up texture um on, on the face doing this kind of thing yeah absolutely and and something worth noting is you you always make incredible work uh here with us on adobe live but this is probably it might be the most detail uh from the get-go that we have seen from you in a stream and it's it is quite especially with cross hatching it is quite uh comic book like and uh i love it Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I often do sort of quite quick drawing on these streams, but I thought mm. it might be nice to slow it down a bit and sort of try and get a bit more detail into this character. I think that's feeling okay so far. Um, so I've got the rest of the character down. I've just left that bit of the face. I think the only thing, you know what, sorry, I'm going to be, because I said I'd be detailed, I'm going to be a bit pedantic <laughs> here and start this eye again. I feel like that section was a little bit um a little bit squished up so mm. let me just get my reference back and I think it well while you uh redraw the eye which is something yeah. we all have to do from time to time yes. uh we do have a question from manny here uh very do you ever do sections of a very detailed character like krampus um like the face or the feather in a different layer or is it all on the single layer uh that's a very good point i i definitely do do sections or uh, um um on on different layers um just to sort of uh keep keep the sections clear so for instance i've, I've merged them together now but mm. uh this pen i knew it was going to be really difficult to draw that on top of the rest of it so i've done that separately and then brought it into the the um the main um sort of composition with with line work i do usually try and keep it on the on the same layer i think mm. it um there's no reason to, to, to do it either way, but I think it gives, um, you sort of, I like black and white drawing because it sort of kind of forces you to sort of, um, make hard decisions sometimes. You don't have quite as much room to move and there's something about working on one layer that, uh, I don't know, it feels like it gives the work sometimes a little bit more rigor. It's, mm. it's a bit less sort of loose juicy than a lot of digital art can feel. Um, but that, that's just personal preference, so there's no reason to do it otherwise. When I get into doing the color, I have everything on a spare layer. I really don't mind. Um, um, uh, I want everything to be separate that way. Um, yeah, and I, I, I like this process of sort of building up these big blocks of black color, and then just with an eraser, I can kind of uh, cut back into those um, and lighten up some elements that, that I want. Okie dokie. Um, I think that face is looking pretty good. Um, so now I'm going to start the process of, I knew this was going to happen. My, my wife was telling me that, uh, I never leave enough time. Well, sorry, I don't, I, 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 I give myself way too much time to, to, to work on these things. So, um, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to push through. Um, 
what I'm thinking though is if I inevitably run out of time and finish this character, um, uh, it'd be great to get some suggestions of other kind of paraphernalia that I could fit into the scene. If there's a side table with a Ooh. chalice on it or something like that, or some Christmas decorations in the background. If anyone's got any suggestions of things I could add into this drawing, definitely let me know and I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, so as I was saying, I've done a little bit of the, the, the coloring already, but I've mm. left some of the uh, interesting bits to, to still be worked on. Um, so I've got quite a bit of that uh, character blocked in there and I've gone and given myself a colored background to work on Ooh. top of as well. And I used to always just kind of work on a white background and not worry about it, but having the, um, the correct sort of tone in the, in the, in the background um, gives a lot of context to when you're coloring and making sure you get the, the, the lighting right. So I find that really helpful. So I'm going to have that just sort of simple, single tone in the background. Amazing. And then is, is um, was there any rhyme or reason uh, to these colors that you picked out? I know Krampus in the, in the quick Google that I did, it's a lot of, a lot of black, a lot of red, uh, and sort of very earth tones. I'm curious what inspired this color palette that you're going with? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, I mean, sort of the green is sort of a, a slightly uh, Christmassy one. You're right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's all still pretty flexible. I might be able to change some of them. I wanted the, the fur to be kind of yellow, like it's like it was a white fur coat. Mm, oh, kind of yeah. Hay, so it's so gotten it's a bit kind of, stained, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's gone all sort of greasy and matted and horrible. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'd go with the dark green. Um, and with the, the um, if you look at a color wheel, um, uh, a lot of us talk about contrasting colors, sort of opposite colors to each other mm -hmm. on a color wheel. And uh, because I didn't want it all to fade into one, I decided I'd use the purple to contrast with the green. And I think because I'm thinking also about um, um, when I've got Santa in the other one, I wanted them to be in the same chair. So um, the red and green of Santa will contrast nicely with the purple as well. So that's kind of why, why I went with that. But there's not mm. a lot, there's not a, any sort of deeper significance to it. It was just yeah. kind of a in the limit choice. Yeah, sometimes you can go for historical, uh, <laughs> I say historical, I suppose, in, in quotation marks, yeah. <laughs> um, for historical accuracy. And sometimes it's, you know, what makes a compelling image. Yeah, yeah. I kind of liked these kind of really saturated colors for, for something comic like this because um, mm. it kind of made me think of uh, a lot of the old comics, um, like the old um, Marvel comics I might have read in the 90s or something. And a lot of the really saturated colors that they use were just kind of, that was just what was available for sort of oh, cheap, yeah. cheap printing. Um, so I guess a lot of those kind of colors uh, are sort of sentimental for those reasons as well. Mm. Yeah, I recall a lot of um, surprising uh, amount of like fluoro pink and reds. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And just really spectacular color combinations that I don't think you would see as much. Because um, I think they might be a bit kitschy now or yeah, they're, yeah, they're a bit definitely. too comical. But I yeah. think um, oh, I like them very much. So yeah. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, I'm just putting in a bit of the, the, the block color. And like I was saying, with colors, because I want to sort of keep everything separate to make it easier to manipulate, I've, I've kind of, um, I, I always like to work in lots and lots of layers. Um, and I've kind of got all my sort of flat colors in there. So I'm going to start mm -hmm. shading some of the, this character now. I like to have all my different uh, flat colors, so all the the skin tones and the jacket tones and the fur tones all on separate layers so it's easy for me to switch between them and work on them individually without having to sort of make sure i'm drawing within the lines all the time um uh if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and once i've kind of sort of put in the shape of, of of color there um i do something called alpha lock which um is just a um it's kind of a, a box that you can tick um, on each of your layers. And it just says, um, I, I'm just gonna draw within the confines of the pixels that I've already drawn, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. So um, so with the, the coloring that I've done, say on the hand or face here, um, Alpha Lock is this little box um, up the top of the layers panel. Um, and it's just that sort of checkerboard one. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I turn it off, I can draw uh, over here, I can draw wherever I like on the canvas. 
But if I turn alpha lock on, then I'm just drawing within the space of the pixels that I've already got. So that's a really easy way to sort of make sure I'm just drawing within that chosen area. And um, you could you could achieve a similar effect um, using your clipping mask as well, just in yes. terms of sectioning off uh, um, a piece of the canvas to color. Is there any specific reason why you uh, prefer using the alpha lock or is it just out of convenience maybe because that doesn't create an additional layer um, no, that no, no. Um, yeah it's just out of convenience um, that I'm using it but actually on this layer I'm using both I'm, I'm doing uh -huh. <laughs> and upper lock um, um, but there's no particular rhyme and reason why why they're not all clipping masks I think just to keep sort of my amount of layers that I'm working with down um, mm -hmm. for sort of um, convenience sake um, Okay, so I'm just going to start blocking in some light bits of shade on this character. I want him to look kind of quite scary and sort of mottled. And mm. one of the things that you can sort of do to make characters look scary is kind of just sort of give them some features like they look um, sort of uh, sort of flushed or unwell or something like that. So mm. I'm going to add lots of red around his eyes and on his nose as well. Um, and if there's sort of like contrast and saturation, it looks quite unnatural on, on, on many faces. If you look at sort of a airbrush model or something, there's often sort of, uh, it's quite an even tone, but if you've got patches of really desaturated color and really saturated mm. areas, that can make it look like the face is sort of flushed or, or, or angry mm. or something like that. Um, so that's something I'm gonna use a little bit here. So I've just got a really soft brush and I'm just adding um, a quite an intense red to some sections. Right, okay, I might choose one color here that I'm gonna start doing the, the shading with. I've already shaded some sections of the legs down here, so I'm just gonna use my color picker to pick up a little bit of that color. And I'm gonna use quite a thickly opaque brush here. I'm gonna start sort of working in some areas of shade in that oh, color. Wow. That already has such an such an impact. Awesome. Yes. Many agrees, uh, saying, "Wow, that's awesome!" And also um, has a suggestion uh, of the table with the chalice. And I think Manny's been doing some research as well because they also oh. suggested a basket with birch. So ah, uh, another fantastic. fun fact: birch yeah. is the <laughs> Fun fact with Krampus. Um, birch is the kind of um, wood that, um, or I should say um, birch uh, sticks and twigs is what um, it carries around to hit people with. Um, so birch is, um, is a good call out. And actually, uh, I also read that for, for parents with particularly uh, mischievous kids, they might actually adorn their uh, home with birch all year round. So they'll uh, paint birch um, sticks gold and either hang them up or place them somewhere uh, about the house to remind their child to behave. So or, festive. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily the, the gentle parenting that we that we have nowadays, but a bit more a bit more ominous. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um I'm going to do a, a similar kind of rendering uh, just on the, the, the hands that I had here. So again, with hands, if they look kind of like um, worn down or scratched or something, I'm, I'm really going for a creepy kind of character here. And again, right around sort of the, the, the knuckles on this character, I'm going to add that bit of red. And then I'm going to get a sort of nice sort of shiny pink uh, contrasting color. I'm going to turn my opacity way up. Um, and just sort of work in some, some highlights to those hands here. Um. And um, I'm noticing just with having a simple base color and having such a low opacity brush, you're really getting so much more of a, um, a full gamut, I suppose, uh, of color and making the, the whole hand or the face much more uh, voluminous. I'm not sure if that is exactly the quiet word, but as opposed to using um, sort of a very opaque brush where you just very clearly get the sides of, uh, or the panels of a hand. Um, yeah, this yeah. a lot softer, but also um, more realistic. 
Yeah, I often start with like a really soft brush to get sort of the general curve of light or color on something. And then mm -hmm. I go in with, with something much more, I guess, kind of intentional. You're really putting down a, um, a, a an intentional mark there. One thing I wanted to do with this character is that I quite like pure black and white when it's just like a, a drawing that's just straight black and white. Mm -hmm. um, but when it gets into color, sometimes the black, um, uh, it, it, it looks a little odd sometimes when you've got sort of a very light section of the drawing that fades off into a darker section and then just goes into pure black. So sometimes I like to sort of pull out that tone a little bit by coloring my line work. We've done this on the stream before, mm -hmm. but I thought this would be quite a cool one to do it with. And uh, the way that I'll do that is just by painting onto a clipping mask on top of my line work. So I've got my line work layer here. Oh wow, that's um, the, the true horror of Krampus is yeah, yeah, <laughs> the drawing really without the line work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much it changes. Um, and like we talked about before, I'm just going to make a new layer on top. I'm going to apply a, uh, a clipping layer. So it's um, um, uh, so I'm just drawing into that, that pixel space above. And now I can sort of color directly um, into my line work. So it might give it one overall color. I'm going to use this kind of dark red. And it's not a big change at this point. You can't really see it. But uh, once we get closer, you'll you'll see what I mean. So now you can see my, my line work is kind of that intense dark red. Mm. Um, and I'm going to start sort of shading in different sections. Um, so say on, on this section here, we've got that, that um, uh, yellow bit of fur. I'm going to get a really dark yellow that's really saturated. I'm just kind of painting a little bit there to sort of lighten up that whole section um, and have something in a similar tone. It just kind of softens the drawing a little bit. Um, there's some sections that I want might still want it to be a, a pure black in the shadows. So maybe in the, the really darkest areas of the drawing, I'll go back and sort of make that a pure black. And I'll do that in some sections like around the, the pupils where you want it to be as dark as possible to show up the details. But in some lighter areas, like say this uh, top of the hood here, I want that to sort of, I really want to soften up that kind of area. So I might choose kind of almost like a lime green, but get a saturated version of it, something quite dark. I'm going to paint um, into my line work there. And you can see the line work still is there and still stands mm -hmm. out, but it kind of just softens up that bit and it blends more easily into the background. So there's quite subtle changes that you're making there, but um, uh, I like that it, um, yeah, it gives a kind of almost like a more painterly vibe to the whole thing. Yeah, I was going to say it, it kind of looks more like just very um, uh, stylized, like shadow and highlight as well, yeah. especially when you have the contrast with the green hood where you can still see that it's a dark, um, dark green for the outline. Um, but you can mistake it for for just the shadow. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and would you use any, like, um, I suppose, more unconventional colors to do more like an edge light or something like that? Yeah. Um, um, beyond you know, the line work layer? You can, you can really brighten it up and, and sort of say I was going to do an edge light on there. Sometimes that does look kind of cool. Mm. It's, it's confusing to the eye, though, sometimes when you've drawn the line um, to describe dark patches of, of the, the overall drawing. And then you're using that as a template to do edge light, uh, if, that, if that makes any sense. Mm. I think with this, it's better to leave it as a darker color. And then if I wanted to do edge light, which I think I would with, with this drawing, but is to sort of work still underneath that line work. So I might get a really light color here. Um, and um, I might do my edge light like that. So it's still within the confines of the line. Mm. Um, so you're kind of doing a little bit of both that way. Um, there's no, there's no hard and fast rules to it. Just whatever looks mm. looks good in the in the moment. Yeah, that but makes I, sense. Yeah, might just add a little bit more of that edge light there. It's always a bit of an easy win, the old edge light. Absolutely. Um, okay, okay. Um, I might go in, and add a bit more detail into the face. Um, so we had, um, I've done the, um, eyebrows in that gray color. And again, I'm going to do what I talked about before of just sort of, uh, doing the alpha lock on that layer. Now I can paint directly into those eyebrows. 
I'll just do this bit and then I might get on to adding in some of the suggestions of um, Birch and mm. um, on the, the side table. Um, all right. I'm going to get some, some nice highlights going on the eyebrows. There's a, a concept I was once uh, talked about to um, by a, a tutor I had, and it was this concept of um, what it called um, high frequency and low frequency um, mark making on illustrations to add detail. And there's this interesting kind of concept that um, if um, there's some sections of the drawing that have really, really high detail, it kind of it kind of tricks the eye a little bit into assuming that level of detail applies to the rest of the drawing. So even though I've got big patches of just flat color here where there's nothing going on, if there's some sections here that have got quite a lot of detail and some sections like say the um, the eyebrow where I really want to get some, some really high detail, I might even go down to a two pixel brush um, and I'm just going to do some really fine lines there. Once you kind of have some details like that, that are really kind of detailed, your eye kind of sees those as like these really intense points of, of um, detail or realism or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of like adds to the overall illusion of complexity to, to the drawing. So for some things like the, the uh, eyes or the nose or, or the eyebrows, just those real focal points, I'm gonna add quite a bit of detail to those. Mm. And how many of those uh, highly detailed focal points uh, would you have in, in one character? Because I, I can imagine that if you have too many of them, then it does very much look like everything is this hyper detail that it might um, get a bit overwhelming. Yeah, often it would just be the focal points of the drawing, um, mm -hmm. um, like like the face. Often, um, like uh, in the in the studios of the um, sort of old masters of painting. Um, the, the best artists would just do the hands and the face because they were the, the, the main person to do mm. that. And all their sort of uh, lackeys or the, the sort of interns, I suppose you could say, would be the ones doing the drapery and the skies in the background and that kind of thing. Um, um, so it was just sort of that focus on the detail. But I mean, to go off on a bit of a tangent, um, like if you were doing a, um, uh, a drawing of a building, you could have a, um, um, start again. So, you can have a building with a little sort of, um, uh, I forget what it's called, the sort of um, uh, on the, the top of a castle or something, those ramparts. Mm. Um, you can have a building like that and you sort of zoom back and it's hard to tell what the scale of the drawing is. But if you have sort of um, a, a, a tiny person in the foreground here, um, um, like so, and I went in and put some tiny little windows here, um, like that, mm. um, it kind of suddenly gives this sense of like, wow, that's a massive building. Look how yeah. tiny those windows are. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. It's sort of like, this is kind of like, this is the low frequency drawing. This is the high frequency drawing. And the combination mm -hmm. of those two things gives the illusion of sort of scale or detail. There you go. We've all yeah. learned oh, something new today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I might get to adding uh, some of the um, uh, additional sections to this. Excellent, because so. yeah, as a as a heads up, we are beyond the halfway point okay. uh, right. of our stream today. All right. But we've covered a lot so far, I think. Yeah, certainly. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Um, oh, I don't know why that's not working. Um, Okay, we're gonna have to sketch it by hand. Which, knowing you, it's not gonna be much different from using the uh, the ellipse tool. <laughs> too kind, too kind. Um, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a... Oh, this is always a problem that, that, that I come across. You're trying to draw on the canvas and absolutely nothing is working. And you realize you've just selected sort of ah. all pixels here. Um, it's only letting me draw within those 12 pixels. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Uh, okay, let's get back to what we're doing. So I'm going to draw a little circle here to give myself a sense of what this side table is going to be. Um, and so let's just sort of really loosely mock up what it might look like. We're going to make it look sort of all um, uh, vintage and aged, and we'll give it some nice creepy claw legs. Oof. 
Um, Very spooky. Um, but as always, um, I'm being conscious of time, so we're going to um, use a really fun little tool within uh, Photoshop to speed things up. And we've done this before on the stream, but it's always a good one. And that is the um, um, that's the butterfly drawing tool. So it ah um, oh, yes, the symmetry it, tool. The symmetry tool. Um, I like your version better though, the, the butterfly drawing tool. It's got a little butterfly on it, um, mm -hmm. it, it definitely works. Uh, it's symmetry off, vertical, so I can place this um, this blue line in the middle of what I'm trying to draw, press enter, and now um, as I draw it appears on both sides. And for something like this um, table that I want to be nice and symmetrical, this is um, exactly what I need. So. Um, um, it's going to be a little rough, but that's okay. And this is great for doing uh, things like uh, sort of this, this ornate table like so I can just kind of smash it out and um, it's all going to line up beautifully. Fantastic. And we actually have a, a question here in chat from the one and only Flynn Tracy. Hey, Flynn. Um, <laughs> uh, who asked if you would ever use the symmetry tool to create the legs, um, which I think is exactly what you're going to use it for if i'm not mistaken the legs of the table or someone's legs i i think legs of the table but then please do correct us um if we've got it wrong and if anyone else has any questions about what we're doing uh or about krampus uh we'll do our best to answer them with uh, the time that we have left but still still plenty of time in um in bill terms so keep yeah. the questions coming <laughs> um uh, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly going to use the tool to draw the legs of the table. In terms of drawing legs on people, I've spent a lot of time trying to use the symmetry tool to speed up drawing people, and it never works. It's way too obvious. There's something about mm. you can just identify that, like, anybody who's perfectly symmetrical just looks wrong. Like, mm. like very, like, the, you've, I'm sure you've heard all the stuff about sort of, like, symmetrical faces being more sort of traditionally beautiful faces mm. or things like that. Um, but it's like very close to symmetrical. A face that's completely symmetrical just often looks weird. Uh, and yeah. especially a symmetrical body looks weird. Yeah. Um, people are, are meant to be a bit wonky, I think. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that. It's the um, Uncanny Valley, isn't it? Where it looks it looks too perfect or too, or either not quite human enough. Um, yes, yeah, where absolutely. It, uh, spooks us a little bit. Um, while I've got the symmetry tool on, I'm just going to go ahead and sort of work up a um, slightly kind of ornate chalice um, that uh, Krampus can be having some, it's probably still Coco, I imagine. He's, he oh yeah, hot Coco for Coco. sure. Yeah. <laughs> or mulled um, wine, actually, I think it might be mulled wine. Okay, um, that makes sense. If I can speak on the, the Swedish Christmas traditions, we will have mulled wine uh with raisins and almonds in it and it is oh so delicious raisins and almonds in the mulled wine yeah. exactly yeah oh, oh that's great okay. so, so traditionally right you'd have um uh we would usually get it by the bottle actually um so yeah pre-made uh mulled wine and then you just heat that up in the uh saucepan i think saucepan is the right or the, the pot pot on on the stove and then when it's nice and hot, almost too hot to drink, you'd uh, put in some uh, raisins and uh, almonds and just wait a little bit for them to get a bit soft. Mm. Um, and then that's that's your drink. And generally you would have them in those small, almost shot-like um, glasses. So oh, you just have right. a little bit because I'm, I'm assuming and uh, based on my later experience, uh, once I became a of age drinking adult, um, the proper mulled wine is quite strong. So you don't need much to, right, to okay. warm at winter, but they right. do also have a uh, children's version, which is uh, just juice, um, but also very, very good. Uh, nice and yeah. sweet. So spicy yeah. and sweet, like a warm sangria. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I might get in trouble for that, but <laughs> that's, that's how I might explain it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, earlier on, you mentioned um, how sort of uh, Krampus is the alter ego of uh, Saint Nicholas. And um, I, I wondered if you'd heard of um, uh, the traditions of Saint Nicholas Day in your research. 
Um, so in my research, uh, I only got so far that December 5th is um, Krampus night and then December 6th is St. Nicholas Day. And basically on that day, uh, kids will wake up either enjoying their presents that they got from St. Nick or they'll be nursing their wounds uh, that they got from Mr. Krampus. So <laughs> it's, it's quite a... Um, I'd say quite a traumatic holiday, um, but well, um, my um, my grandmother uh, is uh, German, um, and so um, my um, family on my my mother's side celebrates uh, Saint Nicholas Day, and um, I'm sure there's different traditions, but the tradition that we have in my family is um, on the fifth uh, of December um, when we were kids. You had to clean your room very nicely. Um, and if your room was clean, you polished your shoes and you put them outside the front door yes. of your room. Mm -hmm. And when you woke up in the morning, your shoes were filled with chocolate. And that was St. Nicholas Day, which was very exciting. Um, and I loved it as a kid because it was a, it was like a secret holiday that none of the other kids at school got, but we that got chocolates sweet. in our shoes on St. Nicholas Day. It was lovely. That is wonderful. Yeah, I did see that um, sweets were mentioned more so than presents. So I think that's uh, for St. Nicholas Day. Um, yeah. And uh, that, that sounds that sounds really lovely. I yeah. do. I do recall the, the polishing of the shoes yeah. um, from my parents talking about Christmases of yore. Um, but I, I do like with most folklore and stories like these, I I can so clearly see now that I'm older that they are very genius ways of getting kids to do what you want them to do, whether yeah. it's uh, clean their room or, or stay inside. Um, just <laughs> give them candy the next day and they'll they'll do it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to start working up sort of the, uh, the, the birch, um, the bag of birch rods to um, um, put this in. And I'm going to show you a couple photoshoppy things to um, up this process. So um, I've just drawn um, some sort of rough uh, branches. I'm only going to bother doing uh, three of these. I might mm -hmm. put some sort of uh, knobbly bits on them to show that they're particularly nasty birch rods. Um, and again, I'm just going to put on my um, uh, alpha lock um, feature on my, my layer so I can draw onto it. Now I'm going to select another color and I'm not going to worry about opacity or anything. I'm just going to get a couple little light highlights. And it doesn't look like much now, but it kind of translates later on with something like this, where I'm kind of going for um, uh, um, uh, quantity over quality, really, of, wow. of these kind of uh, drawings. Because what I'm, going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these, these rods, and they're all a bit vertical right now. I'm just going to rotate some of them, layer them together, Make them a bit wonky. Um, so I'll just move them up and down. I'm sort of trying to create almost like a random brush. And now I'm going to duplicate those sticks. I might turn them upside down, um, put some like this. Um, I'll rotate them again. I'll move some around again. And I'm just trying to sort of make the illusion that um, I've drawn 100 sticks instead of just <laughs> drawing three. Um, and one of the other ways I'll do this is I'll take the ones in the background and I'll change the lightness of them. So I'm going to make the ones in the background nice and dark. Ah. Make the ones in the background lighter. So and I'll flip them over. Just do as many things as I can to sort of give the illusion that um, I don't want them to look symmetrical, but I've made lots and lots of these. Mm -hmm. It's um, a nice thicket of birch. Yeah, and then we've that. already got a nice yeah thicket coming together there. So I'm just going to flatten all of those together. Um, and um, we might put them sort of coming out from hiding behind um, mm. his armchair there. Um, he's got his tools of the trade ready. Again, I might just duplicate those again, give a sense of a real big bunch. Um, and then over the top of that, um, I'm just going to drop the opacity on those so I can draw on top of them, and we'll just draw the outside of the bag. Um, yeah, again, bag is actually another element. Um, so, of course, when Krampus goes around and terrorizes the children, uh, if you don't get uh, beaten up with the birch sticks, um, you might be so lucky that you get thrown into his 
bag and and take him back home uh, to his lair or oh, right to hell. So yet another um, <laughs> reference to the the true Krampus. Yeah, yeah, it it adds a different element to Christmas because for for most kids on Christmas, it's it's all upside right now. Mm -hmm. There isn't quite such a sense of like it could go Dread. either way. <laughs> Will this be the Christmas I get the toy they want, or will mm. this be the Christmas where I'm whisked off to Hellfire? Um, yeah, add a certain frisson. Keeps them on their toes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I might make this a kind of dark red. So I'm just gonna layer that in. Uh, I'll bring my sticks back, and what I'm gonna do to give the illusion that the bag sort of continues behind those sticks is I'm just gonna get a darker color, darker version of that red. And I'll just paint it directly in there so it feels like they're emerging from that bag. Um, and that doesn't all look like much together. I'll just make a folder out of that. That's my birch rods. And we'll just put it behind Krampus. And that's starting to look about right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and both a heads up that we have uh, just under 10 minutes left today. Um, is also a comment from Flynn saying, uh, what modern Christmas is missing? The threat of kidnapping. And uh, <laughs> then I couldn't agree more. <laughs> All right. Uh, cool. All right. Well, I might keep just doing a bit of uh, shading around Krampus and filling him out a little bit. Um, unless anybody has any suggestions of things you think uh, need adding to, um, adding to this character. Um, yeah, let us know in chat. And uh, also, if there's any suggestions, I haven't quite finished. Um, uh, next stream, we're going to start working on uh, this Santa character over mm -hmm. here. Um, and I've started sort of sketching him in, but there's a long way to go with this one. Um, and uh, uh, I had a suggestion from my brother to sort of try and incorporate a, a little bit more of a, um, because Krampus is kind of of this uh, sort of Norse origin, it would be fun to have some sort of Norse, almost sort of like a pagan uh, vibes to this kind of Santa. So if there's any suggestions of things I could add in there as well, just let me know. Um, I think a, a quick and easy way to make anything look Norse or, or pagan is probably to get some runes um, in there. Oh, yeah. So I think um, okay. good to check out and see if there are any Yuletide uh, specific runes. Um, but then I think uh, nature is, is quite a big element, um, at least in my experience of, of Christmas in Sweden. Right. Um, so you could have, um, I think it's fir, fir trees for the Christmas trees. So to contrast with the birch, you might have um, some fir to, to decorate around um, Santa Claus. Um, now I'm trying to re recollect the Google search that I also should have done, uh, which is around St. Nicholas. Um, but I think runes is the first step mm -hmm. and, and very decorative sort of folk arty yeah. uh, imagery, I think is it's a good starting point. Awesome. Okay. But chat, if you have any suggestions, um, please let us know. And since we're streaming again, same time, same place tomorrow, um, we'll make sure to uh, get in all your suggestions from today into our stream tomorrow. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, keep going with a little bit of the um, uh, sort of shading detail on the, on this this fur. Mm -hmm. I think I want to add a, a bit more of a sense that um, we were talking about of kind of um, um, sort of grime or, or sort of dirtiness to, mm. to, to this part of it. So I'm just going to start um, painting a little bit of uh, texture over the top. So make a new clipping mask and um, I've got quite a few sort of um, textured brushes that I can that I can paint over the top with. And I'll just start adding a little bit of that. So you can see just a little bit of that texture appearing. Mm, a little bit of dirt and grime. Yeah. Um, I'll just kind of work that over the exterior and it might be good to do a similar thing over the, um, the green coat. So I'll find my coat layer and we'll give it a similar treatment, but maybe I'll go for a lighter over there. Yeah, just kind of dirty it up a little bit. 
And I've got a nice broad, simple brush, um, looks like uh, this. And I like to use that one for doing a lot of highlights. It kind of, um, um, uh, yeah, gives that, that sort of big, big broad brush stroke that I like to use to block it in. With um, the, this, this um, it's a very warm picture because we've got that sort of orange background. So when I'm doing highlights on it, I, I want to be thinking about sort of like, what's the meeting point between uh, this green color and the orange in the background? Um, and um, uh, it would sort of be going more towards the, if you look at our color slider here, we've got green at the top and orange below. So I kind of want to find what's in the middle. So it's going to be a kind of yellow light that will be coming off. So it's good to be kind of conscious of what those sort of contextual colors are um, when you're adding light and shade to, to your characters. Yeah, that is a really neat trick. I've never um, thought about it in that way before of, of actually looking at the, I suppose, the dial to get the correct color. Um, so that's a massive learning learning for me in order to get, you know, the atmospheric lighting. Um, yeah, yeah it's a good feature to use and uh, an, an interesting thing about it is that um um say we took something like the the armchair here that's quite a tricky one because mm. um uh if we color slider um the orange of this side is almost directly opposite to the the purple it's it's mm. almost a purely yeah. contrasting color so there isn't really much, a, a very good in between um, and when you've got two contrasting colors shining on each other, it almost becomes black and white. Um, mm -hmm. So the correct lighting for a purple armchair in an orange light is actually more of a gray. It's a, it's a um, well, anybody in the chat, I, I'm, not, I'm not perfect in my <laughs> color theory. No, I'm, I'm more, taking your word for it, Bill. But, what you but, say but, is law. <laughs> but something like a um, um, uh, yeah, a light gray or a, or a pink or something would be appropriate, um, um, because um, yeah, I mean, if, well, let's try and sort of mix it. Um, if I add a little sort of a transparent orange of my purple, mm. and we'll test that color. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a pinky color, so a sort of pinky gray would be the right approach. Yeah. Because in my mind, I am imagining like a massive roaring fireplace between these um, two. Yes, I might have to. I do have a, um, uh, I don't know, over the years, I've kind of built up quite a few um, sort of Christmas drawing assets. And I do have mm. a big roaring fireplace somewhere. So Excellent. I'll I knew you would. Dig that up to, to add to our character here for the for, for next time. Um, Okay, and um, just in the last couple of minutes that we've got, I'm just going to add a bit of detail to um, the hoods and the, the chains here. Did you say that chains were sort of part of the general costume? Uh, yes, yeah, so from my um, uh, brief Google, um, he does carry around both a chain and uh, a bundle of uh, birch sticks to harass the townsfolk, specifically the children. So, yes, these chain details here on the the hoofs would be accurate and something else that i did uh, see but i would want to double check um is apparently he has one human foot and one uh a goat foot or sort of a cleft foot which we were both saying um before the stream kind of is worse um <laughs> it's a little bit scarier um, having one of each um yeah i did didn't work that into my design but it's one of those things that like uh yeah, it's it's very surreal and odd the idea of having mm. one um, 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 yeah one goat foot and one human foot, mm. and uh, I think it would largely kind of confuse people. It's very creepy. Um, yeah, it's it's just a little bit too odd, or like it's it's subtle, and when you notice it, I don't think you'd be able to forget it or unnotice it. Yeah. Um, yeah which I think is very synonymous with a lot of, uh, at least in my experience, Swedish folklore and how our sort of creatures of the night and day um, are designed. Mm -hmm. However... A... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go. I was just going to talk about um, uh, one of my favorite artists to, to reference for sort of drawing creatures or, or monsters is um, a, uh, a Dutch artist from 
think sort of the Middle Ages, called Hieronymus Bosch. Have you seen his mm, work? Yes. Yeah. Um, he's, he's done a lot of very famous, creepy um, uh, pictures. And I think sort of one of the, the creepiest things about his work is that um, all the monsters that he draws, you get the sense there's no predecessor to them. They're not, there's not like a kind of dragon or a kind of ogre or something like that. Mm. And completely new made up things. So they've got all sorts of weird things like people with part animal parts or, 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 or things like that. And there's something about them that's so much creepier that they feel completely original and 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 uh, strange. It's like he's thinking of all, all of them for the first time. Oh um, and it's something about that kind of, yeah, uncanny, creepy, creepiness of it that's, um, that's so interesting. Definitely uh, straight out of uh, Guillermo del Toro yes. movie for sure. But on that creepy note, um, <laughs> That brings us to time, sadly. Okay. I would love to talk about creepy monsters with you all day, Bill. Um, but sadly, we do have to go. But we will be back uh, same time, same place here tomorrow uh, to work on the, uh, I suppose, the polar opposite um, part of the pond. Uh -huh. no, or, oh, yeah, okay. okay, you get it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I was hoping someone might get it, uh, but we will work on that tomorrow. Uh, to find out more about Bill, check the description where links to all the socials are. Um, thank you so much, every, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Bill, for part one. Uh, can't wait to continue this tomorrow. No worries, it'll be a much more cheerful, festive stream, less creepy <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, looking forward to it. Um, thanks again, Joanna. Thank you. See you later, everyone. Okay. See you guys.